Salam Sangwinani Moweni Namaste Vanakam Hetepu and welcome to the Sunday's edition of The People's Voice, produced and presented by your host Shabnam Pelesa Mohammed for Salam Media, your humanitarian journalism portal and platform. We're broadcasting live from Tegrini, Durban, KZN, in South Africa. Welcome to the show. Before I introduce the context to our topic as well as our brilliant guest this evening, let's help you tune into a painful, a critical, and a robust conversation so you can comment, ask questions, and share your ideas. Here's how we get connected. You can join us in one of about 10 ways. You can watch via Salam Media's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram. You can listen live via Salam Media's website and the SoundCloud account, as well as the Salam Media or TuneIn app and all free-to-air decoders. Before we go any further, I'm going to start a live watch party from the Salam Media page, which you're welcome to do as well, so people on your profile and your groups will be able to join the conversation today. You go to the Salam Media uh, Facebook page, you click on Share, and uh, you click on Start Watch Party. If you like, you can add a caption and uh, you click on Start. And that's a live watch party on my profile, as easy as that, a very important conversation we're having today. For context, I'm going to quote Yasmin Sukha from an article she wrote very recently. 25 years ago, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established through the promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act 34 of 1995 to deal with the atrocities of the apartheid era and to build a national unity and reconciliation. Apartheid South Africa was the richest country on the African continent, sadly, but one of the most unequal societies on earth. Under apartheid, mass removals of millions of black people made room for white cities, white suburbs, and white farms. By 1913, the theft and pillage of land was complete. In the building of modern South Africa, black labor was utterly indispensable and black lives utterly expendable. More than 100,000 workers were killed and over a million injured in South African mines from 1900 to 1994. White racist supremacy was buttressed by laws and policies which disenfranchised and dehumanized black people who became migrants in their own land. Horatio Vavitsky, a distinguished Argentinian journalist and human rights activist, visited South Africa in 2005 to participate in a conference on prosecutions for political crimes of the past. Vavitsky, together with mothers of the disappeared known as the Madre de Plaza de Mayo, assisted by the Center for Legal and Social Studies, CELS, in Argentina, won a landmark ruling in 2001 Setting aside the amnesty laws in Argentina, it paved the way for the conviction in Argentina's domestic courts of senior military officials for gross human rights violations under the past dictatorship. That from an article written by Yasmin Sukha. Our topic for this evening, what does a reconciliation day mean in the context of apartheid crimes, including continued economic apartheid? What will bring healing to the victims and the families of apartheid murders that the TRC did not resolve? Will justice finally be seen with the NPA allegedly looking into reopening cases? And how can civil society support restorative justice? Our guests this evening, Imtiaz Ahmed Kaji, Moteba Mohapi, Kasim Khan, and David Forbes. Let's welcome them into studio. And that's everyone. Imtiaz Ahmed Kaji, of course, the nephew of apartheid activist uh, Imtiaz Timol, Moteba Mahapi, the daughter of slain Sasso organizer Mapetla Mahapi, Kasim Khan, the national coordinator of the Imam Haroon Foundation, and David Forbes, a documentary filmmaker of a, who produced a film called The Craddock Four. Welcome to the People's Voice. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Shabnam. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I think we've just lost Moteba there, but I'm sure Sadiq is going to bring her back. All right, we've got quite a robust conversation we need to be having this evening. 
quite a few people joining us on the live video as well as the watch party. So we're looking forward to some interaction around a critical topic that we refuse to hide any longer. But let's start here. And I'm going to start with Imtiaz, Mateba and Kasim. Uh, for the benefit of listeners and viewers, please share with us who Ahmed Timol, Mapetla Mahapi and Imam Harun were and the circumstances behind their tragic deaths, as much as you are comfortable with. Let's start with Imtiaz. Yes, many thanks, uh, Comrade Shabnam. Look, Ahmed Timor was an anti-apartheid activist. Um, he was a teacher at the Rudderport Indian High School. Um, in 1966, um, you know, he went for pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. And then uh, around March, April 1967, you know, he lived with his close friends, Comrade Aziz Isupad in London. Uh, he falls in love with Ruth Dongoni. And in 1969, the Communist Party decides to send him for political training to the Soviet Union. And he's accompanied by former President Thabo Mbeki and Ann Nicholson. Um, upon his return to London in late 1969, the High Commander of the Communist Party in London makes a decision that uh, Comrade Ahmed Timor should return to South Africa to set up underground structures. And he obliges, returns to South Africa around February 1970. And Shabnam, for a period of 18 months, as he's a teacher at the Rodeport Union High School, my uncle sets up underground structures for the Ben African National Congress in South African Communist Party um, with a simple message of letting the masses know that despite the fact that political leaders were banned, they were exiled, um, liberation movements were unable to operate in the country, the underground struggle was to ensure that the masses knew that the struggle for liberation continued. And, and, and this was my uncle's mission, um, to distribute political literature at that particular time, as there was no social media, and gets arrested at a police, so-called police routine roadblock on the 22nd of October. And four days and 18 hours later, police claimed that he had committed suicide, not forgetting Shabnam that he was already the 22nd person to have died in police detention. Lux Martin Dooley being the first in 1963. And like those that preceded him, apartheid era inquests simply exonerated security branch police officers uh, with impunity. And they ruled that my uncle had committed suicide. Um, and the reality was that instead of silencing the masses of South Africa, the killing of Ahmed Timol only um, gave more impetus um, to ordinary South Africans throughout the country of all different races um, to continue the fight against uh, the racist apartheid regime. And this was the context under which my uncle was killed in 1971. And as we well aware that my grandmother testifies at the TRC 1996, um, through the work of the Legal Resources Center, Foundation for Human Rights, Weber Wenzel, unprecedented in a democratic South Africa, the Amatimol inquest is open in 2017, and there's a historic ruling reversing the 72 inquest from committed suicide to have been murdered in police detention. Mm, quite a critical and robust summary there um, into Ahmed Timol, and may he rest in power. Uh, Kasim Khan, I want to come to you now while we wait for Moteba. For the benefit of listeners and viewers, share with us who Imam Harun was and the circumstances behind his tragic death. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Shabnam, and <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to speak about Imam Abdullah Harun. Uh, Imam Harun was a uh, a, a congregational leader of Muslims in the Claremont area in Cape Town. <clears throat> he joins the mosque, the community, uh, at then the youngest imam of the time, uh, at the age of 33. Um, and in his uh, um, pastoral work, in his work in the community, he reaches out um, across all sorts of racial um uh, religious uh, divisions that the apartheid government had put in place. But he comes out particularly strongly uh, from the beginning when uh, the group area is implemented and he um, starts speaking against the uh, various apartheid legislation that is put in place. It is then that he particularly gets the attention of the security police and one of the particular actions that Imam does, and uh, you know, we uh, tend to forget that under, under apartheid, it was very difficult to move around between communities. And Imam was known 
for particularly reaching out to what is then African townships of Langa, Nyanga, and Guguletu in Cape Town, which was particularly no-go areas. And he uses his uh, full-time job, his day job of being a sweet salesman to enter these communities and to be able to make contact uh, with ordinary people, but particularly also with activists um, from uh, uh, the then particularly banned Pan-Africanist Congress and the military wing uh, POCO at the time. Um, one of the other things that you see in the life of Imam Arun is he's highly active in all aspects of community life, um, whether it is issues of education, healthcare, and he then becomes an honorary uh, um, editor of the Muslim news, newspaper at the time. Um, and one of the other actions that he does is he starts sending students abroad for further study in the belief that Many of our students who are talented, well-educated, are not going to benefit much under apartheid education. Um, Imam takes a, in 1968, takes a trip uh, that takes him to Saudi Arabia, connects with uh, the band leadership in, uh, in Cairo, um, goes over, uh, stops over in a number of European countries, but then uh, in London meets up with Barney Desai, um, and then also with Canon Collins of the uh, um, uh, Defense and Aid Fund. Canon Collins uh, was obviously from the Anglican Church, and this assistance was particularly to provide assistance to families of detainees, uh, particularly those who were detained in, in Robben Island. He, on his return, and again, uh, uh, like in the case of Ahmad Timo, many people would advise, don't go back home. Uh, it is becoming uh, really very dangerous. Um, in that 1968 trip, he had also uh, uh, gone on, on pilgrimage. And what is interesting is upon his return, he is arrested. And the uh, pretext of his arrest is that <clears throat> somebody came to ask him for financial assistance uh, for a family of a detainee. This was a setup by the security police. They arrest him on the 28th of May. 1969, they con they continued to interrogate, torture, beat him until his death on the 27th of September 1969. Um, what follows is that um, a post post mortem revealed that he had 26 bruises across his body, um, many of them uh, sustained during different times of his detention. Um, in 1970 because of the pressure from the community, uh, because of the massive uh, funeral process that had taken, uh, procession that had taken place, um, the, uh, an inquest is held. Again, as in the case of many others who were killed in detention, no one is held responsible. And the cause of death apparently is that he had uh, succumbed to his death based on the fact that he may have fallen down a flight of stairs. Um, an interesting event at the time which has etched the memory and name of Imam Harun in the memory of particularly people from the greater Cape Town area is that on the day of his burial, uh, Cape Town has one of its mass massive earth tremors and so the earth tremors and Imam Harun become synonymous but more particularly where we are at right now is that the in, in February uh, 2019 um, we, as the family and foundation, uh, and the name of Imam Harun, had requested that the um, NPA reopen the inquest into, uh, reopen the 1970 inquest. We have had much progress in this particular space in that we are now at the sp stage where many of the witnesses that were still alive um, have been interviewed um, and that any information that has been available, that is available on the subject um, is being verified. Um, and the process is quite intensive. Unfortunately, I want, to ask, you ask there, I want you to ask, ask you to pause it because we're going to get into the NPA investigation. I want to unpack that in more detail. Okay. We're at 6.15 no on this evening's edition of The People's Voice, talking about what does Reconciliation Day mean in the context of e economic apartheid and apartheid crimes committed against victims who are still waiting for truth 
for justice, for reparations, and for real reconciliation. Muteba Mohapi is also with us. Muteba, for the benefit of listeners and viewers, please share with us who Mapetla Mohapi was and the circumstances behind his tragic death. Um, good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. Firstly, uh, Mabeta Mohapi was a son to his parents, he was a brother to his siblings, a husband to his wife, and a father to his children. He was a friend and comrade to lawyers. He stood for freedom, which probably rendered him a threat to the upper paid system at the time. He was an organizer and secretary of SASO and a member of the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, were some of his um, close comrades. He, he was banned in 1975 under the Suppression of Commission Communism Act, and he was confined to the area of Zulicha in King William's Town. He was detained in 1976, shortly after the Soweto, Soweto uprising. At the time, they were busy with um, River Frelimo rallies, and he was detained. Um, under the Terrorism Act. And that detention is what led to his death and that he committed suicide. An inquest um, following that found that no one was to, um, well, no one was responsible for that, but a handwriting expert. From Britain had suicide note, a forgery, and, and um, that's who my happy is. All right, we're having slight connectivity issues yeah. there, but certainly we can hear you, uh, Moteba, but certainly what's very clear in these desperate and diabolical uh, attempts. Yes, Moteba, we can hear you. Satnam. Okay. What's very clear is these desperate and diabolical cover-up uh, attempts that were made and that continue to be made as an insult to the lives of these incredibly important people in our country's history and its future. So I'm going to ask our speakers to please mute your mics if you are not speaking, just for the purpose of uh, background noise. So we've started off with the, with the personalities of Ahmed Timal, Mapetla Mahapi, and Imam Haroon, as well as the circumstances behind their tragic deaths. I want to move to David Forbes uh, now. You produced a documentary on the Craddock War, during which time you discovered that archives of information had been cleaned in uh, inverted commas. I'd much rather prefer the term diluted, polluted, or erased. Meanwhile, Nyameka Goniwe, one of the Kadak Four widows, died this year. May she rest in power without seeing the killers of her husband held criminally accountable. Talk to us about political interference in the context of the article that you recently wrote called Long Road to No Justice for TRC Victims. Okay. Um, Vanessa, the, the like, archives issue is a is a massive issue which has been ignored everywhere and it's a far greater problem than like anyone actually realizes um for example um i went to a whole lot of trouble to get access to the the uh the, like archives of the south african the police and they said fine uh, you can access them but uh, you will need to bring all your own machines because they they have only old format um, stuff so I went there and I spent three days at my own expense transferred all the material to a new format and then when I finished the police confiscated those types of mine. So that wasn't even <coughs> confiscation, that was actually pure theft by the police. When I um, then 
I had earlier in my research, I tried to get access to the records of the two inquests held into the Cradock Four and also the PRC records. And the Department of Justice refused me access. So with the South African History Archive, we went to court. It took us two years going through all the steps with the minister and the appeal and everything. Anyway, we got to court and they settled out of court. And I got access to records that had been seen and heard in open court. So there was actually no justification at all to have any secrecy or to prevent anyone having access to those records. And this is what happens time and again, is you get blocked by these little bureaucrats who are acting on orders from higher up. And, you know, if you look at, at the whole history of those TRC cases, there were 400 cases that were referred for prosecution at the end of the TRC. And it went to the NPA and then there were just delays and delays and delays and it it just went on and on. And the, one of the key reasons for those delays was that the like ANC feared that if we prosecuted some of the apartheid murderers, we would also have to then prosecute some of the ANC members. And so they, they then, you know, didn't want that to happen. And so this whole process went on of just blocking by every kind of bureaucratic strategy to stop us hearing the truth, finding out, prosecuting and getting justice. And it went on and on since uh, 1999 until now. It is only in the last few years that we've been able to prize open that door a little bit through the use of lawyers and NGOs, you know, people like um, Yasmin Suka and the HRC, MTRs and Kasim, they, they know, you know, how hard everyone has been trying to open that door and find uh, justice. In the meantime, these delays have meant that witnesses and uh, perpetrators have been getting older. Some of them have died. Some of them have been murdered or silenced. And so this whole thing just goes on. Now, when I got into the archive, I found that it had been altered, that the archive material that was there had been censored because I had seen the first copy of a bundle of legal documents um, from advocate George Bezos. And um, these were held at a at a at an archive. So I, I'd seen all of these, but I wanted to film the originals that were in the like national archives. And when I got into the national archives, I compared documents I had from the one from the one private archive with the ones in the national archive, and I found certain effort. David's had been torn out and were missing. Others had names had been whited out that others were missing. And so it went on and on. And I have proof of this. I actually, you know, if, if, if we had access to the financial uh, power to be able to bring charges, we would be able to open up what is a huge can of worms at the National Archives because um, intelligence operatives 
from NIA and, and the secret service and everything have been going into those archives for, you know, 20 years and they've been cleaning them. They've been removing references and those uh, people include people from the old regime and people from like ANC who are, you know, they're all trying to just clean history. And then also the the ANC archive in Fort Hare, which ought to be a public archive because many of us contributed to that archive. And it is actually probably one of the best archives of the liberation struggle. You can't get access to that archive or they've got, I think, seven levels of access. So you and I mean, that archive ought to be accessible in full to everyone in South Africa. As David, all I'm going to ask you to pause there. I'm going to ask you to pause there because yeah. you make such an important point. And what, what's very clear to me is that we're not living in a democracy, given what you've just explained is, is going on with these archives and this history that belongs to the people of this country. And secondly, that's what, what is being employed is a Stalingrad a uh, tactic to make sure that um, justice is not achieved, continuing delay tactics, make sure that witnesses and uh, victims disappear. They, they pass away, people get tired, they move on. Uh, so I think you've contributed some very important points. And certainly I hope at the end of this discussion uh, or afterwards that people are going to step forward with the resources that are required to allay these criminal charges where proper investigation into what's happened to the archives. I want to come to our um, third question now regarding the TRC. So the TRC's five volume report was 3,500 pages. The Human Rights Commission claims 21,000 people died in political violence. And of course, that's the death they're talking about, not the mutilations and the disabilities, et cetera, and the, the psychological trauma. The TRC's victim list stands around 21,747. What happened at the TRC, which of course denounced blanket amnesty, and what should have happened, Imtiaz? Well, Cobra uh, Shabnam, I mean, the statistics that you've just uh, mentioned in front of us are absolutely startling because you would have imagined that once the TRC had completed its work um, in 2003, when the reports were handed over to President Mbeki, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit that was set up at the National Prosecuting Authority, specifically designed to reinvestigate TRC cases that were outstanding, should have dealt with this matter. Um, because it, um, it was a platform um, to start this particular process. And it is understandable that it faced numerous vast challenges so in the matter of Comrade Ahmed Timol, the likes of Rodriguez, Neville El, Seth Sons, Captain Troy Fanikar were never subpoenaed uh, to appear in front of the TRC Shabnam. And one can imagine if all of them that were living, um, including uh, accompanying Joao Rodriguez, um, they would then have been put to the sword to give a full disclosure of what happened to my uncle. And, would, and we would have had an absolutely different outcome because we would be in a position to have held those responsible for detaining and torturing Ahmed Timol, responsible for his death. Mm -hmm. So the TRC was a vehicle, in my view, that allowed victims to come forward um, to reveal the truth. Um, there was a commission, but there was absolutely no reconciliation. Um, and and it, is, it is preposterous to, to accept that, that uh, Eugene de Kock and Ferdi Barnard must take sole responsibility for all the crimes uh, committed by the racist apartheid regime. And this is what had transpired. So, so, so from 2003, um, in the period of 17 years, the record speaks for itself, Shatna. Um, the matter of Nokotula Similani has been on the court roll since 2015, 2016. And the latest that we've heard is that it's been postponed to next year, August. And in that particular period, the one apartheid era perpetrator has already passed off. Um, in my uncle's matter, um, it purely happened because of the work done by the Foundation for Human Rights Legal Resources Center and Weber Wenzel, where we had conducted the investigation, located witnesses, uh, presented a case to the NPA. And on that particular basis, the Amatimol inquest was open. And we should never forget that the, that the NPA had failed to locate Joe Rodriguez. 
Rodriguez only appeared in front of the TRC Shabnam because his daughter had contacted me, and on that basis, you know, he was he was uh, he was summoned in terms of a subpoena. Um, in the matter of Dr. Dr. Neil Agat, um, again, the matter was opened this year, but they took so long until apartheid the perpetrators had passed on, the likes of Stephen Whitehead. And once he passes on, they then pronounce the reopening of the Neil Agat inquest. So there's absolutely no coincidence around it. The, the, I, want the matter of the question, I want to turn that same question to Kasim because I see we're already at 6.30. Two comments here. TRC denied trials of the colonial corporate butchers who committed genocide. Watching past victims' feet was a joke. That from Nawawi Matthews. Kasim Khan, what happened at the TRC and what should have happened? I think one of the concerns that one has when one looks back at the TRC is that leaders of the liberation movement um, tended to think that there was some equivalent between um, apartheid, which was clearly a crime against humanity, and the legitimate and just struggle of the people through these liberation movements. So this whole concern that there's constantly been post the TRC and even during the TRC that um, if you expose, if we expose your crimes, you will expose our crimes. The point is our struggle was just. And this is something that we need to emphasize continuously, that our legitimacy of our struggle, our moral high ground on which we continue to stand is, which, is, is exactly which is being undermined. And the first space at which it was undermined was at the TRC itself, where people now felt that People wanted to know what happened in military camps, who spied on who, who, was, who, who killed who, whatever. When our struggle is just, we are not afraid to speak the truth. And the events that happened after the TRC, as Imtiaz had pointed and David had written about, um, all the machinations that takes place in the National Prosecuting Authority, in the, the roles of various NDPPs, such as uh, Vusi Piccoli, et cetera, and they day-to-day -day struggles to open cases, these are things that has a basis for it. Why are you so afraid um, that your secrets will be exposed? What is it that you were doing? Were, is it not true also? And let me end on this one. Let me. Is it not true also that many of our liberation movements, and let us not just speak of one movement, of our movements uh, were heavily infiltrated by the apartheid government and many of our leaders and people who go as far as saying, even post-94 continued to benefit from the largest, the, the, the slush funds that was operated by apartheid uh, uh, um, agents to keep people in a particular line. So when we are worried as to where, whether we got a just outcome or not, then clearly we need to be able to say, firstly, our struggle and apartheid itself were not uh, uh, equivalent uh, um, apartheid was a crime against humanity and it must be pursued. Your comments and uh, questions for our guests would be uh, highly valued in this edition of People's Voice. Moteba, what happened at the TRC and in, in your view, what should have happened at the TRC? Thanks, Shabnam. Um, I think at the TRC, the first step, which was getting people talking about their experiences and inspiring hope, was probably the best step. But what followed then, um, following the, the, the recommendations of the TRC, um, is probably what uh, left a whole lot of people um, without hope. Because whereas the TRC made uh, recommendations, um, our government failed to... Um, uphold those, those recommendations. We, having spoken out at the TRC, we went out, we went there with hope, hoping to um, find out some truths, hoping that some people would come forward. In the case where they did not, we were hopeful that the, the TRC would then um, do some investigations or recommend that investigations be done so that some the truths about what happened to our loved ones would come forth. And that is what was going to assist us in, in reconciliation. But that never happened. So whilst the TRC started out um, as a very great initiative, 
uh, it has shown after a while that actually it was a half-hearted attempt. I believe that the people who wanted to, re to, to reconcile were more the perpetrators, you're the victims than the perpetrators. And so it was a one-sided exercise which caused um, it's which caused limitations and resulted in it not achieving what it sought to achieve. A painful truth there by Muteba Wahapi, but a, but a truth nonetheless. Nanda Subin says that the J etc. became instant billionaires. An important point raised there by our political cartoonist Nanda Subin. David, I want to turn the mic up to you now. You know, various websites, when you do the research, will list about 20 murdered struggle heroes, including uh, Biko, Ashley Creel, Dulcie September, and Ruth First. But there are thousands more, including Nokatula Similani, the, the Cossacks for Neil Agate, Hussein Hafiji, etc., who are erased from the narrative. Uh, and we know that memory is a weapon. Why have they been erased and what is to be done about this erasure? Well, you see, I think that uh, what happens at the end of a war, because that's what it was, is that the victors control the narrative. And so, like, ANC was able to control the whole thing. And because we in Inside the country, didn't know what was happening in exile. We didn't know what was happening in the camps and everything. We were all, all of us, the whole country was focused on liberation. We wanted South Africa to be free. We were not told that first we will get a political liberation and then you know, much, much later we'll be striving for economic liberation. We That wasn't explained to us at all. And so then the like ANC <coughs> comes into power and it becomes a whole a political thing between the like exiles and the like UDF and then, and then there's power um, struggles and everything. And so what happened was not the structural change that was embodied in the freedom charter. <laughs> what happened was just a replacement of the elite. And so we now have a new elite controlling the narrative. And that narrative excludes anything that, that they don't want to be seen. Now, I mean, I think that people like uh, Becky, Bridget McBundler, people like that should really also face, <laughs> face charges of some sort because Becky and McBundler were two of the key people behind the suppression of, um, of these stories. And, you know, the, the, the high-profile ones are are the ones that, that sort of really made the news, like the, the Kadok 4 made the news because the bodies were burnt and stabbed 63 times. And it was, you know, it was a really, really gruesome, horrible murder. And then, of course, there were, there were all the others. Neil Agate, the first white guy. But Ruth first, bomb, you know. So, but... There are thousands and thousands of people who were not erased, but they weren't able to get the, the same level of publicity or they weren't, you know, their circumstances weren't that they were able to get out there and get lawyers to help them and everything. And, and so it's really, there are so many stories that need to be told. And, you know, as a f filmmaker, I thought after 94 that, you know, we would be able to just do screeds of movies for SABC on, on all these stories. 
God, it just wasn't like that. No, you all just got squashed down and stopped. So for me, you know, we, we, we need to hold people like the clerk, Brigadier Squin, General Barcy Smith, Joe Furster, Neil Barnard, General PJ Kutsia, General Krapis Engelbrecht, who was a cleaner after many of those murders, um, N.J. Janse van Rensburg, Craig Williamson, the South African Defence Force. I mean, these, these, you know, apartheid wasn't committed by a hand full of bad apples. And, and when the transition occurred, especially in the South African police. Many of those former security policemen just went over to the new regime in order to show them how, how everything worked. And then they blocked the investigations. They, you know, they Absolutely. had their own I'm going to ask you secret to pause network. There. I'm, okay. I'm going to ask you to pause there. And I certainly hope yeah. that through this conversation and the follow-up campaign by, you know, all of the families that are involved in the solidarity in this, in this, in this campaign for truth and justice, that films will be made telling the stories of the thousands of nameless victims whose narratives are not told or not as controlled as the ones that they want us to know about. And we've got a comment here from Nawawi Mujahideen. official narrative that state violence of this proportion belonged to a bygone colonial or apartheid past and deals were cut. Well, absolutely. State violence continues. The deals were cut. And it's the reason why the TRC focused on in but not the crimes of the banks and the corporates. And I think that was one of the biggest mm -hmm. failings of the TRC that was deliberately set up in that particular way. Um, I want to move on there now. Um, Kasten, can you tell us what's happened since the TRC? And this is you know, going to be a bit of a round robin in a sense. Kasten, the question is what happened since the TRC? In TRC, the question is, what has the response by successive governments been? And Mateba, your question will be, what is the impact on the families who don't have truth or justice? And just in the way of context, we know that President Cyril Ramaphosa received a letter in 2019 wherein former TRC commissioners requested an apology to the victims and the appointment of a commission of inquiry into the political interference that suppressed the TRC cases. And of course, as we know, the presidency to date has failed to respond. Let's start with Kansim's question. What has happened since the TRC? Your mic, Kansim? Muted. I think if we are particularly interested in trying to understand the role of corporates uh, during and post the uh, TRC. One needs to locate and in terms of who are these corporates and where do they fit in in the structure of the transformation that had actually taken place. Now, clearly, the most public events in terms of the meetings in Dakar and in, in Lusaka were led by corporates, were led by people from your Anglos and the Beers and so forth. Um, and so one needs to be able to be absolutely clear that the transition was going to serve their interests. Normally, a person who is involved in business sees an opportunity uh, to make some money. These were not your normal business people trying to uh, look after their business interests. These were the, let, let's be frank, these were the grandsons of the colonialists who came here who want to make sure that their theft continue to stay in their hands. This is absolutely a different kettle of fish in terms of who these corporates were. And so that they were not touched in a, in a meaningful way by the TRC is, is something that is not surprising. And that they are subsequently not touched by it also proves that these are not normal corporates who you now want to take to court uh, um, and then say, give us some money. You will, we will not be insulted like this. We know that they are the true architects of the system that we have inherited, that these capitalist agents wanted 
to maintain the status quo, they did not matter to them who remains in political office. Points made by the Imtiaz, are you with us? Sorry, I didn't. I, I didn't hear you. The question is: What has the response by successive governments been to this campaign for truth, justice, and real reconciliation? No, no, uh, Shabnam. From two thousand and three, like I stated earlier, when the TRC reports were handed over to President Mbeki's administration, the responsibility was on him to ensure that TRC cases get investigated. And the reality is that if you if you clearly follow that there was a clear pattern and a trend that we commemorate anniversaries, we rename schools, we confer posthumous awards, and in their view, you know, uh, uh, families were supposed to be content with that. Uh, because, you know, you, you selectively have amnesia, you remember on specific occasions your comrades who had died in the trenches with you. Um, and this is something that, that, that simply continued from 2003. Um, under President Zuma, obviously, the Amatimol inquest was open. And that, again, was purely because of the work done by civil society and myself, you know, to build a case that led to the Amatimol uh, inquest being reopened. So, so the simple answer is that you see there is a philosophy on the part of politicians that you know, we remember selectively, a selective na narrative. We occasionally, when it's comfortable, convenient for us, we remember our fallen comrades. But when we come to the core issue, Shabnam, of asking who was responsible for the killing of our loved ones, they will tell you, no, no, you know, this is too painful for us. Um, you know, we must forget the past. So they, they selectively remember the past when it's convenient for them. And the reality is that they've got absolutely no mandate from any family to make any deal with any apartheid era perpetrators or the Nationalist Party at the time on our behalf to say, no, a TRC was good enough for you. We gave you a platform to relive the horrors of the past. And now the matter is over. The reality is that it is unacceptable. And the reopening of the Amatimol inquest has started a new movement. And the mere fact that an activist like yourself is bringing this matter to, to the public domain should send a clear message to politicians that our, our fallen heroes and heroines will never be forgotten and our quest for justice and the truth will continue in a democratic South Africa. I'm led to that. And you know, to what you've said to Kasim, it's very, very clear that uh, a lot of what is the, this cover up that's going on is, is directly a cover up of the corporates and the banks that were involved. And those are the corporates and banks that are funding political campaigns. I mean, let's not pull any punches on that. Um, Moteba, what is the impact, Moteba, um, on the families who don't have truth, who don't have justice, who don't really, as a result, understand what this reconciliation day then means? Moteba, are you with us? I didn't hear you, Shabnam. Can you just repeat that? So the question is, what is the impact on the families who up to now don't have truth, they don't have justice, and therefore they don't understand what Reconciliation Day actually means? All right. Um, the families expected um, a lot from the TRC. Um, we expected to hear what at least the TRC had done, whether there was an attempt to locate the people who were responsible for the deaths of our loved ones, and uh, maybe without success. And the impact is that we continue to be left with a sense of feeling robbed, um, a profound sense of loss. And the fact that lies continue today to be carried out as fact, um, make us feel that even though, that, though we are free, but we are not completely free because um, our pain has never really been, been heard. It has never been addressed. And not that we feel that um, the, you know, we are unique, but we believe that the government had an opportunity to do so. The fact that they didn't shows a lack of political will. Um, I think David just now, just now said that um, the victors um, you know, control the narrative. 
Why then did um, the ANC not, not, not pursue that? Why did it not pursue the cases um, of crimes against, um, against humanity? Because apartheid, the system against which they fought and all the other liberation movements fought against, was a crime against humanity. How could that, that then, um, upon us gaining our freedom, be allowed to just vanish mm -hmm. without anyone being brought to book? No system, no institution, nothing was ever brought to book. And today, our father's death is still recorded as a suicide. And nobody, nobody ever wants that, um, you, to think that your parent killed themselves. Other families probably don't know where their loved ones are, or they do know, but they, or they know what happened, but it is incorrectly recorded. I believe that the government owes um, at least that correction and that truth to the families of the people who passed on in the fight against the struggle. Absolutely agree with you. Um, I want to talk about the scathing judgment written by Judge jo Jody Kalapin, supported by a full bench in Tiaz, uh, on, the, on the violation of the Constitution and calling for accountability from the NPA. Last year, you wrote an open letter to the NDPP, Shamila Batoy. But Tori Pretorius, the head of the PCLU, filed an affidavit saying it's not the NPA's fault, it's the politicians who are blocking. Tell us more about this. No, no, it's a very profound point uh, you're making, Shabnam, and I'm really glad that you've brought it as part of our discussion this evening. I mean, I mean, you're totally correct. I mean, the full bench judgment was absolutely scathing. And here we find Tory Pretorius and Chris McAdam in 2019, uh, now all of a sudden talking about political interference, and the judgment was very clear that the NDPP should take action against them. And the reality is that to date, they remain entrenched in their positions. And I'm going to make this point, Shabnam, and it can be interpreted the way our viewers would like to interpret them. It is unacceptable in a democratic South Africa to have apartheid era prosecutors to be given the sole responsibility and mandate in a democratic South Africa to investigate the cases and crimes against humanity that they supported with the racist apartheid regime. And the question must be asked, how is this possible in a democratic South Africa, Shabnam? What hold do they have on our ANC politicians that they can be entrenched in these positions, have a dismal record, have the audacity when, when pressure is mounted in 2019, now to talk of political interference, when they remain silent for all these decades. And a year later, they remain entrenched in their positions. They continue to control the narrative at the NPA. And that is precisely why the case of Neville Elson said sons, there's been absolutely no progress. And the NPA has made a decision not to charge them. So what message are they sending? Uh, even if you open an inquest, you reverse an inquest finding, apartheid era perpetrators will not be charged. This is a clear message that they are sending. And the question must be asked, how is it possible? that the old guard continues controlling us in a democratic South Africa under ANC-led government. And these are questions that must be pursued, irrespective of how painful they might be for our politicians. Because our politicians are very comfortable and convenient talking about uh, the national narrative about unemployment, inequality, gender-based violence, which is very relevant and very true. But ask them, Shapnam, to talk about truth and reconciliation commission and you'll skin dive. And the question must be asked, why? And that is why we continue our call that apartheid era cases must be investigated. And if the NPA don't come to the party, we have total faith and confidence in the judicial system that they will support our cause. Absolutely on point. Moteba, in your view, why is there this blatant refusal? It's not even reluctance, it's refusal all of these years to properly investigate and bring closure to our nation? Um, you know, Shabnam, I think that's a question that, that continues to puzzle me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a clear lack of political will. It actually makes me wonder, and I want to ask how sincere were the current leaders in their fight against the struggle? Was it something that was fashionable or was it something that they believed in with their hearts? Did money perhaps 
blind our leadership and make them lose their principles and cause for which they fought. Because uh, political freedom is not complete if uh, justice was not served. And there has not been any restorative justice. I mean, we continue to see um, a huge um, divide between the rich and the poor. We continue to see um, a huge divide between the elite and people who have not. And um, there is no clear um, effort to actually reconcile the two, especially when you look and look at the fact that politicians continue to be the people who are benefiting from what is supposedly our freedom. But ordinary people do not benefit from that. So I really want to, I would really like to know whether our leadership still have the best interests of the people at heart, whether they are still driven by freedom of the people or whether they are now being driven by what would benefit them because the former cadre, cadre of, of yesteryear and, and the people that we're talking about are people who had real and genuine concern for the people. Now that we are in the driving seat, what stops the people from, the, the, the leadership from continuing then to make sure that um, those issues have been addressed? Well, what draws me to the next question in you know, the driving seat that you just spoke of brings me to the next question for Kasim. Who benefits, who stands to lose, and what does it prove about who really owns power in South Africa? Let me start, uh, Shabnam, by um, removing this uh, belief that we may have in ourselves um, that somehow we and our liberation movements were the victors. No, we were profoundly the losers. And because we are, we are deluding ourselves that we have gained a particular victory at the ballot box, we, are, we continue to believe that we will somehow get some sort of justice for our people. The people against whom we fought are still not only in place, they are amongst us, and as David has called them, the fifth column amongst us. Right? They mock our democracy. They mock our values. And when they say things like, you know what, we couldn't defeat the morality of the justness of the struggle. What they sought to do is to undermine it, to insult it, to attack it by being, in, many, in my view, the engineers be behind the corruption that we see today. So that when anybody mentions a word, a name of a liberation struggle, a movement, a just cause, people are saying, well, what cause were you involved in? Look at what your leaders are doing now. They are all corrupt. Now, where did that corruption start? When those, and here's the point about who, who, who is really in power? Right? The question is, who did not concede power? Right? We may be in political office, but we did not concede power. We did not even know the extent of apartheid's power. When we can rattle off, as David did earlier, a few names of a few generals, right? I can assure you, right, that our liberation armies did not even know the names of the generals they were fighting, right? And so, who is still in power in terms of the economy? Who is still in power in terms of the security? Who is pulling the strings in terms of who will be ministers and it's not the Guptas who came. These are other people who are sitting very nicely on the wine estates deciding who and what will happen. And as soon as we get out of the slumber, right, that there may have been change in 94, then only we will be on the path of justice. Thank you. Absolutely agree. We've got about 30 minutes to go in our conversation today on the people of Boris talking about what does reconciliation mean in the context of continued economic apartheid and what will bring healing to the victims of apartheid crimes. Uh, the next question, I'm going to start with David on this one, but it's a question for all of us here. Of 400 original TRC cases, there are allegedly 11 cases ripe for prosecution. 37 active investigations and 69 deaths in detention, the perpetrators being the security forces, the FANDF and SAPS. What is your analysis on recurring announcements by the resource and capacity challenged NPA 
to complete these cases? And what are the prospects of success if those who are blocking investigations are not held accountable? David. Yes. Um, in defense of the NPA, I, I say only one thing. They are under-resourced and there's a whole lot of um, people they need to get rid of uh, before we can start going after all, all these people. I think we've started to mend the NPA, but other than that, their job was to prosecute without fear or favor, and they failed in that for 20 years, since inception. There have been nine heads of the prosecuting authority, and not one of them ever fulfilled his term because he was in, interfered with politically. And this, this brings me to the key to this whole thing, is that we need to hold people politically accountable. Until we have political accountability, there can be no reconciliation. We need to hold the ANC accountable for their failures to prosecute those within their own ranks, the perpetrators of apartheid. We need to hold the corporates responsible. I mean, all the evidence is there. It's all out there. We've seen it in books. There, there are... Uh, there are truckloads of evidence, and yet we can't do anything because we are not able to hold people politically accountable. And Becky and Bridget Bundler started this thing when, when he was the, the president after Mandela, and Bundler was the minister of justice. And we haven't been able to open it because they just put the lid on everything and we haven't been able to, to open all those cans of worms. And so we have to be politically, uh, we have to hold them politically accountable. We have to start legal proceedings against people like that so that we can open up who was interfering with the path and the passage to but justice. And then we have to then... All right, I'm going to ask David to please pause for us there. We've got a comment yeah. from Salvin Naidu, and he's the curator of the 1860 Heritage Center, and he says, there is no political will to resolve these matters. The solution is in the hands of the people. Rise up and alter the trajectory. Thank you, Salvin, for that powerful mm -hmm. comment. Uh, Moteba, that same question recurring announcements about opening investigations. What are your thoughts on the prospects of success by the NPA? Um, I think, um, as Kasim said, that the people um, that we fought against are still amongst us. I think that should not be lost to us, and we need to therefore regroup uh, to take up the new struggle ahead of us. Um, the struggle, I think, and, and the victory lies probably in civic organization, in people organizing themselves, like the Apartheid Victims Families Group and other organizations to take on the struggle that we are faced with because the political parties or movements on their own are not going to be able to, to handle this. So I think that... Um, as people in civil society, we need to, to, to take it upon ourselves to make sure that we exert the necessary pressure onto our, our leadership and to the political parties um, that are um, in leadership um, to make sure that they respond to the issues um, and, and, and resolve the struggles that we are faced with. All right, uh, Kasim Khan, prospects of success by the NPA's investigations. What are your thoughts? Yeah, let me uh, address this question of uh, NPA's lack of capacity. Usually when an institution has lack of capacity, 
it is either financial or human resources, okay? Now, if you track the reports, the annual reports of the NPA, and particularly after the first year of Shamila Batoy, whatever, it seems that she's able to fill posts. Um, and now who makes the decision on, on what her budget should be? Now, we are uh, pleasantly uh, surprised and, 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 uh, and, and let me say encouraged, particularly by the ruling party, taking a very strong position at the last National Executive Committee of prioritizing these cases and so forth. But it is the very same ruling party who deploys their people, who prioritizes issues that needs to be addressed in South African society. So who will decide the budget of the NPA is the ruling party who continues to have the majority. Now, if you deliberately if you deliberately underfund an institution, then you are not very serious. Okay? So clearly, there's enough uh, lawyers, there's enough advocates to advance this question. The only rider to all that human resource capacity that exists is, as the point that we had made earlier, clear the rust that exists, clear those very same people who prosecuted our leaders, clear them out of the system. And Shamila Batoy must not play games with the family. If Tori Pretorius and McAdams and all these characters are still working there, we want to hear in the media that they have been fired. Right? We want them out of the system because clearly they did not do a job that benefits us. Okay? Now, that's your human resource issue, that's your financial issue. So don't tell us that these issues of lack of capacity cannot be resolved. What can be done is that Shamila Batoy must have the will to do the job. Thank you. Comrade Imtiaz, your thoughts on the prospects of success via the NPA? Lack of political will, lack of political will, lack of political will, Comrade Shah. There's absolutely nothing further and simpler to put than the fact that there's absolute lack of political will. We cannot trust the National Prosecuting Authority. We cannot trust the National Director of Public Prosecutions. We need to continuously mount pressure. And like Comrade Kasim has stated, we support the call long overdue by the African National Congress in the latest NEC between the 6th and 8th of December that the TRC cases must be prioritized. The reality is, who is running the show, Shabnam? In a democratic South Africa, how is it possible? I reiterate, how do we allow the old guard to insult our integrity and tell us they don't have capacity and resources? This has got nothing to do with capacity and resources. The reality is that there is absolutely no political will, and that is why we support the call by the Deputy Secretary General of the African National Congress that there must be a partnership between state and non-state actors. And the call made by the ANC to the progressive uh, lawyers' forums um, for them to come on board, because we cannot totally depend on the National Prosecuting Authority. And again, reiterate that records speaks volumes. They tell us that the investigating cases they're centralizing, then they're decentralizing. And when it's comfortable, convenient, they're centralizing again, insulting our integrity. The full bench of the South Gauteng High Court, as you stated, was scathing. We urgently await the ruling by the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein on the 342 application brought by Rodriguez Legal Counsel. And we are very confident that they will rule in our favor. But reiterate Shabnam, political will, political will, political will, and history. History will judge our politicians. They must never forget that since 2003, politicians, um, ministers of justice, deputy ministers, members of parliament, um, even from politi opposition political parties will be judged. That history will ask, what did you do in your personal capacity to, 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 to preserve the legacy of our heroes and heroines? And we're not talking of conferring of posthumous awards, but did you fight for truth and justice for those men and women who sacrificed their lives in order for you to sit in parliament. This is Absolutely. a grim reminder to them that it will, and we will reiterate the call to them, that as long as we will live, the struggle will continue. Aluta continua. Aluta continua. We've got 15 minutes and two rounds of questions to go. I can see people are floating uh, comments and, and, and heart. 
emoticons all across the screen, uh, certainly a conversation that has been necessary and must continue. We need to have these follow-up conversations. So um, in the second last of our round of questions today, while we are right to examine the role of police and military, and we've alluded to it already, there is a suppressed understanding of the role played by banks and corporates which facilitated the procurement of weapons, et cetera, without which the apartheid regime, of course, would have weakened quicker. Can there be a real reconciliation day without a TJRC, a Truth, Justice and Reparations Commission, into the continued economic crimes that have entrenched structural and systemic economic apartheid to this day? David. Well, you know, I think that we actually can't move forward as a society and have reconciliation because our entire society is broken. Everything is just broken. So what we need to do is to do a, a complete change of direction back towards the Freedom Charter, towards socialism and that doesn't mean communism and Stalinism and all those other terrible things that everyone keeps going on about with reds under the bed and all that. We need to move towards a new social system with a basic income grant for everyone. We need to try and like level everything up. We need people with a political will. Cyril Ramaphosa is silent. We have called on him, and he is silent. Why? And I want everyone to think about that. Why? Because there's, as everyone says, there's no political will. We need to change the entire system we have. We need to get like ANC out of power. We need to change the way we vote. We need to change everything that we have. We need to tax the corporate hire, we, we, you know, there's a million and one things. And these are not outlandish uh, suggestions. They are just uh, suggestions from the unheard narratives of the poor, of the marginalized, of people who are not part of the elite, of people who are not feeding at the trough with all the pigs who like rule us. Thank you, David. Moteba, um, the role of banks and corporates, uh, can it be a real reconciliation day without a TJRC into continued economic crimes that have entrenched structural and systemic uh, economic apartheid to this day? Um, Shabnam, I think um, that really cannot be the case. I think what, what, what the banks and corporates uh, can do in view of what um, was perpetuated, perpetrated by the predecessors is actually to as much as possible because black people continue to experience apartheid um, by the banks. They continue to be unable to um, have access to, to, to financial aid and financial support. Um, so I think the best thing that could be done is to take into consideration what was a black person's experience and bring it to today and ensure, and ensure that you cannot evaluate um, people that were suppressed or oppressed in the same way that you would evaluate people that have been advantaged. And that's something that we've been struggling with. Um, and I do believe that government willing, that could also be enforced so that the playing fields get leveled. For, 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 for everyone. That playing field is being left. So I think until the banks and corporates are willing to, to come to the party and, and, and do their part in view of what they, 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 they um, gained in the past, um, we, are, we, we are not going to see um, reconciliation, full reconciliation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before I turn the mic to uh, Kasim and Imtiaz on the, the second last question, their comment from Nawawi Matthews, and uh, he's got an extract from a website, and it says the ANC held its first National Executive Committee meeting in South Africa after it was unbanned in February 1990 at the Verkehrlichen 
estate on the outskirts of Stellenbosch, a wine farm owned by Anglo-American Corporation, where they were hosted, wined and dined in the very finest South African tradition. And as Sam Peter Blanche informs us in his book, it was at the Anglo-American Corporation's Brentert estate in Johannesburg that Nelson Mandela regularly dined with the Anglo-American chairman Harry Oppenheimer after his release. So that, that second last question there, I'll turn the mic to Kasim next. The roles of banks and corporates, can they be a real reconciliation day without a TJRC into continued economic crimes that entrenched structural and systemic economic apartheid to the day? Well, Shib Shibnam, I think one of the things, again, that we need to clarify for ourselves is who is corporate South Africa today? Um, and that's this idea that the corporations who benefited under apartheid um, is, is some exclusive club um, that they uh, have no contact with our political leaders and so forth is a misnomer that we have to deal with. Now, clearly, the comment earlier about uh, the meetings at Vergelegen, um, the ongoing meetings, our former ministers working for the Rockefeller Foundation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of these things. Let us be clear about who are the corporations. Many of our leaders have become complicit in our oppression, in our exploitation. And when we talk about this large army of former apartheid uh, um, officials who work, who continue to work in the bureaucracy, our own comrades are now in business with these people. So we are complicit in our own oppression. And when Moteba is saying we need to regroup, we need to clearly draw a line in the sand between us and who are oppressors and exploiters, then clearly this is something we must do. But one could go even further and say very, very succinctly that who is Cyril Ramaphosa and who was Harry Oppenheimer to him, right? And our president, today, as much as we still have hope in him and the party that he leads, that they will uh, do the right thing, we must know that Cyril Ramaphosa is the president of that same corporate South Africa that they have funded, that they want. And we still say, we keep that door open. Mr. Ramaphosa, the African National Congress, the families of victims of, uh, 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 of apartheid crimes, are still hoping that you will do the right thing, that you will resource the, 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 the National Prosecuting Authority, that we, we will get rid of these apartheid characters, but we are not fooled by the fact that you have been bought over completely by this corporate South Africa that itself needs to be prosecuted. I can't think of a more respectful way to convey a very robust message to the president. Uh, MTRs, the TRC never examined economic crimes. The role of banks and corporate, same question again, can there be a real reconciliation day without a TJRC into continued economic crimes? Well, no, most certainly. But the question again is that whose interests will this serve? That is the underlying question we must always ask. Why are these things not happening? Because it serves a specific yeah. agenda. And it serves the interests of a certain elite, elite within, within society. You see, it's, 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 it's very fashionable, uh, Comrade Shabnam, for, for, for uh, corporates throughout the country to align themselves to one political leader, which is Nelson Mandela. Very comfortable, very convenient. But not associate themselves with the struggle for liberation in this country. And that is why the TRC was very comfortable for them. Because you, you, you apportion all the blame on the security apparatus, which is correct. But the security apparatus did not function in isolation. They were supported by the conglomerates within the country, corporate businesses, legal firms, with their, with their networks globally. They funded and supported the races of party regime. And now in June, they will tell you they support Mandela Day. And that is why the call must go out to them. They must support this call by the ANC. They must fund these initiatives between state and non-state actors for TRC matters to be reopened and not selectively remember our, our painful past. And again, these debates that you are hosting today are very, very significant. 
because it is these platforms that will convey the messages to them that we have not forgotten that it's not only the security apparatus, the banks benefited. And that is why the Zordo Commission, Comrade Shabdam, is very significant. And let us not be blindsided when the media gives us a selective view of one particular family and comfortably and conveniently forget all the other factors, all the other companies that did and committed worse crimes than this particular family from the Indian origin. So it's selective amnesia, portraying a particular narrative, insulting our integrity, thinking and hoping that we would have forgotten. But the reality is that apartheid era victims' family members know very well that it was not the security apparatus, but the big corporates that supported the racist apartheid regime for decades. They must be held accountable and they must be penalized for their actions. And one punitive measure would be for them to fund these initiatives for the reopening of these TRC cases, Commissioner. Yeah. A call out there by Comrade Imtiaz Ahmed Kaji for corporate South Africa to step up and fund the TJRC processes that are desperately required for real reconciliation in our country. All right, we're down to our last question with about 10 minutes uh, to go. And uh, since you have brought it up, Imtiaz, I'm going to turn the mic over to you first. How is the cover up of TRC cases relevant? to state capture and would a Zondo commission work? Of course, not a Zondo commission with just one judge having to bear all of that responsibility. And I think that was a big mistake in the way this was uh, commission was set up. But how is the cover up of TRC cases relevant to state capture and would a Zondo like commission work as opposed to an NPA investigation? Again, Comrade okay. Shabnam, political world. Let's not forget that our brother Lukanyo Knarata has made a submission to the Zondo Commission. The Zondo Commission to investigate why the NPA has failed to reopen TRC cases. And the Zondo Commission is absolutely silent about that. So the reality is that you are asking the National Prosecuting Authority, who are supported uh, to function without fear, favor, and prejudice, that are captured themselves in dismally failing in instituting. Uh, cases against apartheid or perpetrators. So you see the contradiction. And that is why we are saying that there has to be a dedicated approach to revisit the failure of the TRC, the failure of the National Prosecuting Authority, the respective democratic elected governments. And remember, as every day goes on, Comrade Shabnam, as David has mentioned, apartheid era records gets destroyed. And yes, tons of records were destroyed. But there are many records that continue to reside in government departments. Apartheid era gatekeepers continue to control access to those particular records, which is absolutely frightening, but a reality. But totally reiterate our call that there must be a dedicated uh, capacity revisiting the reopening of TRC cases with individuals that are committed and not like the, the hawks that have advertised positions for all former police officers officers from the apartheid regime to come back and to assist in the investigation of TRC cases. An absolute mockery. And once again, reiterating the fact that whose interests are they serving? So we should never forget that we need to have a real look at the TRC cases. And there are many, many options that don't require huge financial uh, incentives. Yes, the corporate should contribute to the legal firms that come on board. But if it's an issue of political will, they will find truth and justice. And when they are not prepared to do so, the question beckons, whose interests are they serving? Because they are not serving the interests of their comrades, which sacrifices their lives for them to be sitting in parliament today. Absolutely. David, I'm going to ask you the same question. What's your vote on what will work? Uh, an NPA, uh, a reimagined NPA, of course, investigation, or is your money on a Zondo-like commission? It's on... Neither, Shabnam. I think what we ought to do is start a, a, a social movement to arouse everyone from the, the deep slumber after the end of apartheid and, uh, you know, the, the rainbow nation. And uh, we need to start a, a coherent movement on social media because I think everyone's um, at the moment kind of tired of marching on the streets and with cover that it's a bit difficult and that but we can start to put 
pressure on these people. We can start to boycott the products of the big corporations. And, you know, there's a hang of a lot we can do if we coordinate ourselves and we start, you know, each one wake one up, <clears throat> as it were, and we we get everyone moving on this because we are not going to move forward as a country until we hold people and institutions politically accountable and we change the way our society works. All right. Uh, thank you for that, David. They're calling for a boycott of uh, accomplice corporations that were responsible for apartheid crimes and those that have not stepped up since then to play their part in truth, justice, reparations, and then reconciliation. Moteba, what will bring healing to victims and their families in terms of truth, justice, and reparations? What do you believe will bring that healing that is so desperately needed? You know, one of the recommendations, I think, of the, of the TRC was, I don't, I, um, an, an, an apology um, to, to, to the victims of apartheid, which has never actually come forth, and a correction of, 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 of history and a commitment to actually resolve the issues um, and, and the cases um, that were brought um, to the TRC, those are some of the things that will actually bring um, some healing towards the families. If today we're still debating whether apartheid was a crime against humanity, those things should not be um, should not be conversations happening in South Africa. I think government needs to be very, very clear about what our experiences are, and everybody who is a South African ought to be clear about what happened and what these experiences were, and that apartheid was a crime against humanity, and that the people who experienced apartheid continue to, can continue to lag behind. And so we must not be shut down when we are wanting to express the fact that whatever it is that we are lagging behind on is a result of um, apartheid because the ripple effect of, 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 of the system um, continues. You know, so I think what, what will bring healing is, is if there is an ownership and, and an acknowledgement that apartheid was a crime against humanity and that the people who are victims of such are owed an apology um, by, 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 by the system. I want to ask you one more question before we give the last word to Kasim uh, Moteba, and that is, do you have more faith in a renewed NPA investigation? a Zondo-type commission or a people-led commission into apartheid crimes? Um, I think that the, the, the institutions are there. I think um, a movement, as David suggested, is probably what would get some action because a government should listen to its people. Institutions should listen to its people. And if we were to uh, regroup, reorganize, and continue to mount pressure on these institutions that are supposed to serve us, that are, you know, um, financed by, by 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 our taxes. Um, that is something that I think would work. So, as as society, we need to roll up roll up our sleeves. We need to organize, and we need to continue to fight for for our rights. We need to continue to make sure that we stand up for justice, and 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 that we hold our government and our institutions accountable. A call for a new social movement there, echoed by both David and Moteba. Kasim, the last question for you. How can civil society in South Africa and globally stand in solidarity for this desperately needed accountability in terms of apartheid crimes and in terms of economic crimes that have been perpetrated since? What actions can people take? I mean, I know exhibitions is one of the platforms and instruments that the Imam Harun Foundation is also involved with. But what other actions can civil society take to stand in solidarity? Well, Shabnam, civil society usually is strongest when it is organized. And many, in many cases, they are organized into activities or particular professions. 
I think from the position of the uh, uh, families um, of victims of apartheid crimes, we are particularly interested in those uh, organizations representing the legal, the legal fraternity. I want to make two very quick points about that. Your black lawyers associations, your bar uh, associations, your all these bodies that exist should not be requested to be involved in reopening these questions. They should be running towards the families to demand that. So one, we would want to get them to do that. Two, if they are wanting something else, I would like to say that when they look at all of these cases, whether it is Mohapi or Timol or Imam Harun or Biko or whatever, the judges, the magistrates, the prosecutors who were involved in these cases on behalf of the apartheid system should be disgraced. They should be disbarred. They should be studied and exposed. And if they're still working in the system, these professions should be saying, we don't want people who were forwarding a crime against humanity as part of the oppression within our profession. Right? So both in the case of legal and health professionals, there are many, I think the, the Biko example was a great one in which the people who were involved in the, uh, um, in the health aspect of, uh, um, of Biko's de declaring his death and so forth, that they were exposed and they were disbarred. I think our legal profession and our health profession has got a lot to do to save their profession if they were not so much interested in saving us. Similarly, we are asking business if you want business to be recognized as an entity with integrity, not only must you do as India says, fund these cases on behalf of the families, but you must also say good corporate governance is to look in your records and see what crimes your company had committed. Do it proactively. And lastly, I want to speak to our comrades who work in the security cluster, who come up with this absolute BS notion that says, you know, these apartheid guys, they were just professional policemen, that they were just good policemen, that they were just good intelligence officers. They were our enemy. They are criminals. Don't entertain them. Don't do business with them. Expose them and kick them out of your institutions. I thank you. Thank you, Kasim Khan, for some concrete calls to action made by yourself and, in fact, by all our panelists, concrete calls to actions and demands uh, that are made unequivocally uh, of various stakeholders, including uh, a call for solidarity from civil society, from government, as well as um, from the corporate uh, sector. We're going to start rounding up now with a concluding message, which is to say that no social compact between government and people can survive without reconciliation based on truth and justice. Anki Kroch, one of South Africa's greatest writers, stated that it's impossible to acknowledge that the central truth around which your life has been built is a lie. And who amongst us can confront the brutal fact that the moral narrative of our lives, not just what we do, but who we are, is a fraud. And that our goodness was simply obedience, that our normality was perverse, and that our respectability was purchased on cowardice. I want to say thank you uh, with great solidarity and gratitude to our guests, uh, Imtiaz Ahmed Kaji, Kasim Khan, Moteba Mahapi, and David Forbes for joining us on The People's Voice and for being a voice of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you also to our listeners and our viewers. And of course, we still are meeting with students, including Kasim Kaji and Jonas and Sadiq and Rizai. And remember, we ask ourselves in Israel, what am I doing to make our community? Of people's voice.